There's one high school when I was growing up. I mean, everybody, yeah. it's one of those things like, hey, did you break up with your girlfriend? You mind if I take her out? You know? Yeah, 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 for <laughs> sure. Yeah. <laughs> Hey everyone, welcome back. We have a new episode here on the 615 House Podcast. It's your host, Chris Rudiger, and we've had a lot of great guests, some close friends on the podcast, but one of the best parts about this podcast is that I get to interview people that I've gotten to watch and know through social media, but I haven't actually met them in person. So this is the first time that I'm meeting them and learning about their stories. That's the case for this next artist, hailing from a small border town of Del Rio, Texas. He has blended classic country and Norteno sounds of northern Mexico. It's a really unique style, like a country Americana Latin blend that's super rich, and his voice is so identifiable. It's It's got a really unique tone, and I think that's why when he moved to Nashville, it did not take long for him to sign a publishing deal with Warner Chapel, and then also sign a label deal with Warner. He has... Uh, two albums, Faded Memories and Here's to You, Here's to Me, and two of the singles on that second album, Damn This Heart of Mine and Tennessee Drinking, were consecutive number ones at Texas regional radio charts. He's amassed more than 650,000 followers on TikTok. He has tens of millions of streams, performed at the Grand Ole Opry, signed a record deal, as I mentioned, and spent the last year touring with Parker McCollum, Randy Rogers, and Wade Bowen. I'm super excited for this conversation. So, we're going to get into it, and uh, please welcome William Beckman in the studio. Hey, what's going on, Chris? How you doing? I am good, man. I am good. It's so nice to officially meet you because it's one of those things where I followed you online on social media for a while. Thank you. And like, I felt like I knew you <laughs> through the videos. Like, your personality just shines through. But Thanks, it's nice to actually connect in person and like shake hands officially likewise so, thank you for having me yeah man you are man you got some swag dude you, you got the style <laughs> i don't know about you, that but i try you no know? you do man i like this like undershirt you got going Thanks, on man. it's it's a good look and i saw I, I, you know, i've been watching your videos but i i saw that you were rocking a suit for a couple shows it might have been like yeah. around the holidays yeah or something, man but. uh we actually did this it's our second year doing this um this christmas tour that we call las posadas and mm -hmm. and it's basically me just singing a bunch of christmas songs and throwing in like some sinatra american standards and it's it's really cool it's fun for me i've always been a big fan of crooners and and the rat pack and stuff like that uh so to get to play dress up and be Sinatra for like 10 days is really rad. No, but that's what that was from. It, we did. I had to get like three or four different tuxedos so that I could swap them out night after night. But it was great, man. The fans showed up and, uh, you know, I love the, I love Christmas time and, and the month of December. So it was cool. Yeah, man. You're going to be known as the best dressed country artist pretty soon. <laughs> that wouldn't be a bad thing. It would, would it? not. No. <laughs> Do you, did you keep the suits? Of the course. Tuxedos? Yeah. No, I, I bought them and, uh, yeah. You know, uh, it's it's looking like we're going to do it again uh, for a third time this this uh, this upcoming holiday season. So it's cool, man. It's again, it, it's it's nice for me to kind of take a step away from my country uh, side of things and just get yeah. to reinvent myself for a little bit. And, and my band loves it, too, because we're getting to have fun and it's not our standard typical set. So, right. It's, it's probably a chance for them to have a little creativity with their instrumentation yeah, yeah. and just branch outside of maybe the traditional set. Absolutely. List you have. One thing that I, I wanted to talk about because I hear it from, you have such a distinct and rich tone, but I can tell that there is clearly inspiration from the, as you mentioned, the rat pack and the, yeah. the Sinatra and the Presley era I'm like, I'm curious, what did you grow up listening to? Man, it was a lot of that. It was a lot of, um, it was a bunch of different things. Honestly, I was always, I tell people that I can, I can distinctly remember listening to, um, the George Strait 50 number ones. It was like a double or it might've been a triple CD. I can't remember my brother and I had it. Yeah. And, uh, I would like listen to that CD or those CDs, um, religiously so george Strait it's always been a big influence um for me and and of course all that stuff too when i got a little bit older i got really into like the old old country but also elvis and some of the some of the crooners that i that i mentioned but also gr having grown up in texas we, uh, there was a, a lot of texas country that i was listening to and so were my friends so when i was first starting to learn how to play guitar we, I was, those were the songs that people friends of mine were requesting so that's what i would just 
learn how to play. So a lot of yeah. people that I tour with now, like Randy Rogers Band and and uh, Bowen and all those guys. So I mean, it's just a combination of a bunch of different things. Is it still shock you that some of those guys that you were listening to growing up, you're now like on the road and friends with them playing? Like how? Uh, yeah, absolutely. Yeah. There's times. There's times where I where it's kind of funny if we're like at a bar having a beer or something i'm like man my 16 year old self would be freaking out right now right but uh but they've been my buddies for a while now so yeah i'm just grateful to have you know big brothers in the in the scene and uh in the business that that uh can help look after me and you know vice versa it's all about leaning on people so right i wanted to i want to touch base about your start you mentioned that you listen to all this music when did you officially pick up the guitar and say okay i'm gonna write some songs um man i was probably like 13 14 something like that i took piano lessons first but i i learned how to play guitar around 13 or 14 and i didn't really start writing songs until i was maybe 16 you know but i had i had a a little bit of, i had a lot of learning to do because the first songs that i ever attempted to write were not very good so. <laughs> do you remember do you remember the first song you wrote it was called the blazing blues blazing blues yeah it i has, can't even remember how it goes but it was it was it was not good i was about to say there's a guitar over in the corner can we get can we get a verse and a <laughs> no, chorus of blazing I, blues I, I, if, I, if I, I couldn't remember it even if i tried man yeah. um it's just one of those things i just remember the title and i remember that it was a funny blue, like it wasn't a funny blues song but it was a blues song so it was very repetitive but yeah but you know you got to start somewhere and that's where i started Right. No, that's that's awesome. And then, you know, one of the things we, we were chatting about when you first came in is your uh, live show and your ability to tour. Um, I know that you've been playing at some you know, Texas circuits and, and, and beyond and like kind of sinking your teeth into like the live performance process. When did you write songs and record songs first and then tour or were you kind of already touring prior? Like what what? What was your live experience, um, you know, pro and process? Yeah, no, I definitely had, when I started touring in the state of Texas, I had already released some music, but, you know, before I had any music out, I I moved here to Nashville and I was doing a lot of the writer's rounds and stuff like that, you know, mm -hmm. Belcourt Taps, that place used to be around. I know, you know rest in peace, man. Yeah, they right. tore it down. Uh, so. Man, I used to play that place several times a week and that's where i would go and i would write songs in my bedroom and then i would hop on some of these writers rounds over at that place and uh test them out you know and kind of play them for for the other people and see if they got a good response or not there used to be right. uh in printer's alley too there's a uh, alley taps is that place still around i don't i don't i haven't even been man down there so i long. think you know i think it is i don't know if they're doing as many writers rounds as they once yeah. were it was but i to your point this like, was all pre-covid this was pre you know 2017 yeah. you know 2016 2017 something like that but it was a great place to meet right i mean you probably met some of your writer friends yeah. or, or got feedback on yeah. these songs right you know and they'd give it they'd give you a couple free beers and and that <laughs> it was enough for me to be like yeah i'll come in test out these songs and have a couple have a couple beers and uh and i did that you know that's that's that was sort of my first experience playing a lot of my songs that i had written up until then like i was in a cover band when i was in high school so i'd play I'd, i wasn't a stranger to the stage by any means but as far as like man like this is a brand new song let's see yeah, nothing right. recorded nothing nothing even on i might have like put really crappy recordings out on like soundcloud back then but i didn't have any records out or anything well it's definitely a different process than you know playing you know a 1990 george Strait record which yeah. is great but you know you just sort of karaokeing it to an extent versus like hey i put my heart and soul into the song nobody's ever heard it before yeah here goes nothing like right. that's an intimidating process you know especially in nashville you know where it's like you're essentially in the biggest town in the world for it you know against the best of the best and so it can be a little daunting to be like to be that vulnerable especially when i was that when, when i was that young and felt like i didn't really not that i wasn't good by any means i, I think i did I, I had a certain amount of confidence in my ability to write songs but it you, you know the, there's always that one person that you're like damn i, I gotta follow that guy <laughs> you know yeah. or, or her you know and yeah and man i saw some incredible uh artists and songwriters and and heard some insane songs you know just on a random tuesday night for like nobody but 
12 people in the crowd, you know? And yeah. uh, so that was going back to your question. I, I did that a lot when I was living here in, in Nashville full time. And, and then I, I briefly kind of went back to Texas for a little bit to, to try to play some shows and get a band together. And then that sort of evolved into me, uh, opening up for a couple different artists down there. And, uh, and I still play heavily in, in Texas. That's, uh, I, I played almost every venue there is to play. Um, yeah. So yeah, it's awesome. And I, I enjoy it. And the fans are some of the best fans in the whole world. What I love uh, about that Texas circuit is their appreciation for original music because you know, Nashville, it's intimidating. There's a lot of songwriters, but people are, you know, it's a great, great collaborative community as well. But there are other cities you go to, and if you try to play an original song, it's like people are talking, slamming right. beers. Like, <laughs> you know, it's like, did anyone even listen? And I think, like, it's really, you know, it's it. The part of the process that I think a lot of people forget is like as the artist, you're also receptive to feedback and reactions of the crowd. And like when you're playing something for the first time that's your own and people are, you know, chatting or whatever, yeah. it's like, oh man, maybe this isn't it's it. all vibes, man. You know? If the crowd's giving off you know? vi certain vibes, I mean, you pick up on it. And you know, it's funny too, because I, I've always been um I've always been really comfortable in, in, in theaters and uh, very quiet listening room type environments. Um, I think a lot of that has to do with a lot of some of my songs are, are kind of intimate like that. And my voice is able to like I'm, I'm able to really kind of make things delicate, if that makes any sense. Mm -hmm. When I started playing when I got a band together and started playing like these big rowdy shows where people were like screaming and it was like you, you, the idea is to hype it up and kind of get it really energetic I struggled with that for a long time when I first started doing it I kind of had to learn learn how to do that and it's funny to me because some people or most people that I've ever met are kind of the opposite it's it's like being in a being in a theater type situation is really really daunting for them and then yeah being like at a festival or something or, or like in a college town where it's a bunch of young kids getting drunk and wanting to wanting to want to hang you out know, yeah and party. you know right. throw beers up in the air and stuff right. uh so i had to kind of learn how to do how to do both but yeah whether whether the crowds and having a great time or whether nobody's saying a word that, that's kind of important for me to be like okay how are we gonna how are we going to put them in in the palm of your hand? I mean, it's going to be one of two ways. You're either going to, you know, pyro and smoke and you know really try to blow their blow their minds, or just reel it back and be be that guy that that's able to, you know, have them there in the palm of your of hand. Of course, of course, With that and maybe wear a nice suit and you'll get their attention. Yeah, too, that'll right? help. You know, yeah. Um, yeah, man. I so you know I followed your journey. I know you've put out. Um, two albums, I believe, in the past couple years. Yeah. Um, which is a lot of music, particularly for an artist, um, like you know, coming out of the gate, right? Like you, you got. I mean, you've been playing and writing a bunch, but that's a lot of music. And it's great music. Like, talk to Thank me you. a little bit about the process. I want to talk about the first album. Yeah. Um, because that, that when did that come out? Twenty twenty nineteen. Uh, first? yeah. Well, faded memories came out in twenty. 20 i think 2020 um, okay yeah yeah and fate. but but yeah that that record i started at the very kind of yeah it was at the very beginning of the pandemic because a lot of those songs i had uh i'd worked up with my producer and and there wasn't a band in the studio at all it was essentially him and i just kind of layering a bunch of stuff because we couldn't really get anybody in the studio you know uh and so it was really just two people that making it sound like there was a full band. And then I just cut the vocals and stuff, which is fun for me because mm -hmm. I, I love pulling stuff apart and adding things and taking my time with it. Sometimes when, especially recording here in Nashville, when you have a whole band, it can, it can go by so fast. And it's like, they'll listen to the song and you cut it three or four takes. And then it's just like, okay. And then, you know, mm -hmm. on to the next song and you don't really have time to sit down and and really live with with what's being tracked and stuff. So it was it was an. By the way, I forgot to mention a, a lot of the tracking for that first uh, record we did in Springfield, Missouri, of all places. It was why, why, over there. Why'd you go to Springfield rather Again, than Nashville? Again, man, it was just it was just COVIDy times, and it was it was hard to get into a studio here. And w my producer, who lives over there, has uh, 
a friend that's got a really, really nice studio. And, and yeah, I don't even think we were going in there with the intention of like starting on the record. I think we were just going to do like pre-production stuff and kind of mess around and try to get some sounds. Mm -hmm. And it ended up just being a great trip and we cut a bunch of cool stuff, but it was just, again, him and I, yeah. and we, I think we did, we did a, we did a song of mine that I wrote called 30 miles. And then we did a cover of Bruce Springsteen's I'm on fire, which I don't think was ever really supposed to come out. And we did that song and it came out so cool, almost like yeah. a West to me. It sounded like a Western kind of right. kind of, it could be like in a Western soundtrack. And, uh, and I decided to put it on there just cause I thought it was so, so rad. But yeah, those two, those two songs in particular, it was just him and I, it was just two people recording and we just layered everything. That's he did, amazing. he did the drums and like the bass and I did most of the guitars and piano and stuff. Yeah. So and I was going to say, you're a multi instrumentist yourself. How many instruments can you play? Um, the ones that I claim that I can actually get away with, I can play piano, I can play guitar, the harmonica and the bass, the drums, I can I can get by, but I, if I would I would never for sit your, in for I, your cover band. Not yeah, for your I would, yeah, session. I would never sit in with another band and be like, yeah, yeah, I'll, I'll play drums on this song. Yeah. Let me let me take a pass on yeah. this one, right? That's uh, one of the things that I have seen you do, and uh, to your point of that Bruce cover, you have a really great ability to take songs that are not maybe country or exactly in the lane of what a William right. Backman song is, and kind of put your own twist on. I think it's a great sign of your artistry Thank and your you. awareness of where you want to go. And I saw a bunch of that that you've been posting on TikTok. What yeah. a bit you'll take like a, you know, like a, a cover song and mess around with it or whatever. Um, when did you first decide to get on, not even TikTok, but like social media and kind of like, you know, start like, all right, I'm doing this, right? I got songs, I got a market, I got to promote. Like when did that all start? Yeah, that was probably, I'd have to say, um, I mean, I was definitely very active on it b before, before the pandemic. But w once when it, when the pandemic happened is when I found myself with a lot of time on my hands, and and that's when TikTok was kind of king. Uh, and so I didn't have honestly anything better to do but make videos, and it felt good feeling like I was, even though I, I, I or most people felt like they had their hands tied behind their back because they couldn't go out and tour or really promote, uh, promote their music by performing. Um, it felt like by doing TikTok videos and being able to engage with the fans that were already following me, but also making new fans at the same time, it felt productive and it made me feel good. And, um, and I did it and it didn't, I didn't matter to me whether I was promoting my own music or just making funny videos of me covering a, you know, whatever kind of song it was, uh, it was just a, a cool way for me to hopefully cast my net a little bit wider and yeah. and make make some new fans. So that's that was the whole the whole idea behind it. But uh, you it was have cool. you have quite a sidekick. Um, well, I'll have to pull up this clip here for reference. Yeah. You do a really interesting rendition of Fast Car. Um, yes, wh where ev sort of every other line, and you have a good friend of yours that, that kind of comes in. That was before Combs recorded it too. Yeah, so you were on top of it before Luke. Do you do you feel like Luke maybe took some of the thunder from you on Fast Car? Not at all. He's got a great he's got a great version. Um, and you know, I messed up the words in, in my <laughs> in my video, but that video was honestly just kind of a fluke. It was me. It was me. It was supposed to be me genuinely trying to record a, a nice rendition of that song because it's everybody knows that song and it's such a beautifully written song uh and my buddy my buddy andrew was was with me and was just being a goofball and kind of messing up. you know he would just ad living stuff being being a hype man anyway it i thought it was funny and i put it up there not thinking much of it but mm -hmm. it got like over 20 million views or something like that and i don't even know how many read yeah. posts it got and stuff but that's uh, wild man. like <laughs> other people took the sound and had vi like millions and millions of views too and had viral videos so just kind of spiraled huh? it just kind of spiraled it was funny there there for a minute uh yeah we were we were all all over tiktok and uh you probably had like a bunch of new followers and that you must have been blowing up messages i did and yeah all that. every once in a while i'll still have people ask me to play that song at a show which is funny. That's that's crazy. But I try to stay away from it now because Luke, you know, Luke's got a great a yeah. great hit with it, and uh, sure. you know, but it was fun. What's yeah, man? It's it's crazy to me the power of what one video can do. Not, I mean, 
with that song in particular, like the amount of eyes and ears that were that became aware of who like William is as an artist, and then like followed you and are like I'm sure some of those people that came from that video, you know, have stuck around yeah. and continue to support. It's like the power of social media is just like mind blowing. Absolutely, man. I think what's the craziest thing is how <laughs> it's funny how when you don't try to do something, or I guess when you don't try to have a viral moment is when it happens and when you try to follow the trends or whatever's going on that's relevant it just never seems to land because that was truly one of the mm -hmm. that was one video that i probably least expected anything to happen but you know it's funny because it, it's all in it's all in the hands of the of the uh of the viewer you know if they wanted to reshare something or if they thought it was funny then it you know, clearly works but uh, right i think it's just the authenticity behind it really yeah. it's it when you take a moment that's so real of you performing this cover and singing great and then you you know knucklehead of a friend yeah. is like jumping in the background it's just it's very humanizing yeah and i think sometimes people get upset with like overproduced or fluffed up stuff and like that's one thing I think I've realized is like people are smart, you know, people can kind of read the, you know, the room, yeah. the room and like transparency you know, is great, man. You know, it's like authenticity and, and being genuine, I think goes so much further than like, Hey, look at me. I've, I've got talent and I can sing. It's like, well, yeah, there's a, a 10,000 other people on this app that can do the <laughs> right. same thing. So fast forward after this you know tiktok moment after you put out a couple records what's crazy just your trajectory man you get a publishing deal with warner chapel yeah. you now have a record deal um you go and play the grand old opry i mean let's talk let's start there's too much there's a lot to unpack here yeah. but let's let's start on the opry front i mean when you got that call like give me the play-by-play -play. um yeah, no, the, the, when I got the call, it was amazing. Obviously, it's everybody's dream to to play the Opry and uh, something I've thought about since I was a kid. Uh, but yeah, it was it was it was awesome. My parents flew in from from Del Rio and uh, it seemed like half of my hometown was was there for it. But. But yeah, it was definitely a dream come true. And, and I sang one of my songs, Bourbon Whiskey, because that's like a really traditional country song. And, mm -hmm. and I wanted to do that. And then I played a, a song in Spanish, Volver, Volver, which is a famous mariachi song. Um, but yeah, just to stand in the circle and to get to look out there in the in the crowd and and uh, feel the history, feel the love was, was definitely something I will never forget for the rest of my life. You, you say it so casually, you're like, in this, you know, Volvero, Volvero, <laughs> I can't even do it. The mariachi song, I mean, everyone go watch this clip. Like, no, you you absolutely crush this song in, like, fluent Spanish. I'm watching the video, and I, it's, like, one of those things where, like, I thought you were mouthing the words and somebody else somebody was else. singing <laughs> behind the curtain. I'm like, there's no way this kid, you know, knows Spanish. But then I realized that's, like, a big part of your background mm -hmm. and your culture, like, so like what you know what is it what was it about that moment or maybe about kind of like your artistry it seems like you're bringing in a lot of like you know hispanic influence yeah you know and people ask me that all the time and honestly i, I have a hard time answering that because that's just where i'm from you know it'd be just like any anybody else like if you grew up on the coast of florida it'd be like somebody asking you like what's the beach like i'm like i don't i mean it's just it's the we're my home i mean that's just kind of how it is you know sure and i and, my, and del rio for the for those watching that don't know del rio's right on the rio grande in, in um on the southern border of of texas so it's right on the uh northern border of mexico so if you left the house that i grew up in and you wanted to be in mexico it would maybe take you three or four minutes you know to, to cross the border and in, into acuna which is the neighboring or yeah the bordering town so yeah it's just like people coming back and forth everybody speaks spanish you know, when I was first learning how to sing, yeah. most of the time, not most of the time, but a lot of the time, I was doing these little cover band uh, shows and stuff. I mean, people would just naturally ask for songs in Spanish. It's just kind of the culture there. So it was inevitable that I learned how to do that at an early age, and I didn't think much about it. Mm -hmm. So it's just part of, I guess, me as an artist. And then going back to the Opry, one thing that... I quickly realized is like, 
yeah, I had a lot of people that were there to support me, which I, which is one of the greatest feelings in the world to have, you know, your family and everybody coming there. But there were so many people there at the Opry. They just happened to have a ticket for the Opry that night. They have no idea who I am. They have no idea. If, they might know kind of some of the bigger artists and stuff. So it was all, honestly a lot of exposure and it was a great opportunity for me to just showcase like, hey, look, if you don't know who I am, let me show you a little bit about where I'm from and what I do. Right. And, and that's what I kind of remember the most from that night. And that's why I thought it'd be important for me to sing one of my songs that I wrote that was arguably the most country thing I've ever written. Yeah. And then a song in Spanish that's like, look, this is this is a little piece of my hometown, you know, here. Dude, I love it, man. You take you take a traditional country song that's very much in the pocket of what you're doing. And then also, you know, there's a Hispanic song that is also in the pocket of what you're doing and you're blended together. And like, I mean, people, there was clearly just a standing ovation. A bunch yeah, of people thanks. probably followed you from it. Like, it's, it's really, really cool what you're doing. I'm blown away. Like, I know it's like, you're like, oh, it's, it was where I'm from. Like, it's crazy to me, but like, you're a couple miles away. Like, were you ever like, hey, like, friends, you guys want to pop on over to Mexico for a day yeah, and then well, come we back? Young. Like, did you do yeah. day trips to Mexico? Yeah, I, all the time. Um, I mean, that's where I kind of learned how to drink a beer, honestly. <laughs> Uh, but you know, there's a there's a lot of uh, history in in Acuna, which is the, like I mentioned, the town that borders my hometown. You ever seen the movie Desperado with Antonio Banderas? Mm -hmm. That movie shot in uh, with a big shootout scenes. Most of the movie is is shot there in that town. But there's a famous bar there called the Corona Club, and that's where a lot of those shootout scenes happen. Really? And I filmed a music video for one of my songs in the same bar. So the song is danced all night long yeah and it was cool because we did it like as a one take so it's a one shot like a oh dude i a love one, take. one takes um, one takes are so cool yeah but that bar is where they filmed that movie in the 90s wow so that's my hometown that's crazy yeah how many people are in your hometown my hometown's probably like f a little over forty thousand people okay forty five thousand people something like that yeah, yeah. so it's not like no, it's not a tiny it's town, crazy small, but, but it's, it's tiny. Small, it's, small. it's tiny enough to where every most everybody knows everybody. Sure. When I was growing, there's one high school. When I was growing up, I mean, everybody. Yeah. It's one of those things like, hey, did you break up with your girlfriend? You mind if I take her out? You know? Yeah, 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 for <laughs> sure. Yeah, everyone knows that. I get it. It's the small town stuff, man. You know, I just think it's great. You're like, hey, I'm, you know, you guys want to pop on over to Mexico? <laughs> I got a got a gig in Mexico tonight, yeah. and then back in the states tomorrow. It's it's just great. Um, we're gonna, we're gonna take a quick break. We're gonna be right back here, guys, on the Six One Five House podcast. We're back, guys. Country artist William Beckman in the studio. Thanks for tuning in. I'm having a lot of fun. We're chatting about his his past, his story, playing the Grand Old Opry, working on new music. Um, but I want to take a quick second here to play one of my favorite games. This game is called Rank These Five Things Without Knowing What Comes Next. William, I gave you the rundown. Okay, I'm nervous. I don't know why. Yeah, I can see you're shaking, man. You're shaking in those boots. Right. But um, here's how it goes, right? Rank these five things. Give you a category, but you don't know what comes next. Okay. Rank these five things. Category is Elvis Presley songs. <laughs> On brand, right? Okay. Uh, first up, we have Jailhouse Rock. I'm gonna go with a three. You're a safe play to start. Yeah, you're just you're you're just that one's gonna be in the middle. You're seeing what else is on the board. Oh yeah, because there's I could think of so many other ones that I <laughs> that I like more than that. But yeah, next up we got Hound Dog. Probably a four. Okay, what about um, Heartbreak Hotel? I'm gonna go with five. Interesting. What about um, Can't Help Falling in Love? One. That's the one for, for sure. you. Oh, you were quick on that. Yeah. And last is uh, Suspicious Minds. Yeah, that's freaking the two. Really? So that yeah. was pretty. That was pretty good. Yeah. Actually. No, Dev, can't help falling in love, man. That's always been one of my favorite. I, I cover that song and uh, the recording of that song, just the way it was tracked, was insane yeah. to me. Uh, so yeah, I was waiting for that one. I'm glad you mentioned it. That's good. <laughs> if there, let me ask you this: not that, not because Elvis has got too much, too many great songs. Not that we're kicking any of these songs out, but if you had an honorable mention, is there one I missed? Oh man, um, I mean, I, I always loved his uh, his version of "Always on My Mind." If you've ever heard his version of that, yeah. Uh, but yeah, man, he had so many great he had so many great um, records and songs. Man, I'm a big fan. Did uh, have you watched the Elvis movie? Yes, I did. What did you and think? I'm halfway through the Priscilla movie. Oh, okay, yeah. 
What do you have think? You, have you seen the Priscilla movie? I haven't seen Priscilla. Yeah. I have seen Elvis. Um, what do you think of uh, what's his name? Austin Austin Butler. Butler. Right? Yeah, I thought he did good, man. I, th- I thought he did good. Uh, it's it's one of those roles that's been done a bunch of times, but I thought he did a good a good a, a good job yeah. with it. And and I thought it was cool that just given the whole. You know, Elvis had a crazy life and, and um, you know, wasn't the prettiest side of show business. But if you think about it, you know, I'm, I'm glad they shed a little light on that. But if you think about it, man, nobody had been that famous, like, a, as a as an entertainer. Like, he was the mm-hmm. first one to sort of pioneer that. So nobody knew how to deal with fame like that. Nobody knew how to deal with, uh, sure. you know, there was never, there wasn't a management deal that, that was that was that bad. You know, he was like, he, like he, I feel like he had to step in every pothole that, the entertainment business could throw at you so that everybody else would be like, okay, so that's not what you do kind right. of thing. It was and, in a weird, it was the test case for the rest of the business because right. of how big he was. I'm going to ask you something just off the top of my head here. Cause I think Elvis was so influential and so big. Like I would almost argue like no one could ever be as impact or just monumental, mm-hmm. I guess, as an artist. However, like I think we're seeing it right now with like early signs of like what Taylor Swift is doing. And like, am I crazy to say this? But like, I know Elvis is here, but like, mm-hmm. is Taylor Swift like the next Elvis? I, I don't think you're crazy for saying that. I think she's just she's just as influential as is anybody at, at Elvis's caliber. Um, I think it obviously it's just a different time. Mm-hmm. You know, the, the it the way things get passed around just with the internet is a little bit different than, than things were back then. But, uh, I'm a, I'm a huge Taylor Swift fan and I love that she writes her own songs and that she seems like a, a really smart, like businesswoman too. And, um, and I think she's a great role model, man. If anybody's going to like fall in love, you know, if you want young, young kids, especially young girls to look up to somebody, man, why, why not it be her? Yeah. I mean, every four to 24 year old girl is in the palm of her hand. So, um, whatever she's doing or whatever she's eating in her seal reel, it's, I mean, it's working. Um, I want to do another round of rank these five things. I'm very curious to see your reaction to this because you're like, I can tell you're very, um, how do I say this? I don't know. You're just thoughtful. You're analytical about music. (laughs) Thank you. So here we go. Rank these five things. Category is decades of music. Okay. First up, we have the 1970s. Okay, that's gonna have to be. Uh, oh man, that's uh, that is gonna have to be like number two for me. Okay, big 70s guy. Yeah. What about the 70s? Got you going. Man, I, I honestly like a lot of the songwriter stuff, like the Neil Young and uh, like that those cat jim croce and all those yeah. cats that were big in the 70s I, I like a lot of that what about the Still, 1990s james taylor too 90s um i'm gonna go with a four on the 90s i do like the 90s there's was great mu- I, I mean there was great music that came out of every decade but uh you ever head banging to uh nirvana or oh no? yeah yeah, <laughs> yeah who does i mean come on that right. stuff's who contagious doesn't? dude you know next up we got 2010s probably five i you know because i don't uh we we live you know that like we lived through through that and and I guess I have just a different perspective on it because I'm like oh yeah I remember when that song came out but I there's a couple songs that I remember that came out while we were while I was growing up and I'm like this is this is my you know this represents me or whatever I'll yeah. never I didn't have a lot of those I don't know if you did I mean there were a couple Maroon Five songs there's, that I can remember. I'm like, yes, like the, like any like I'll I will be in my fifties and I'll hear that song and it's gonna right. take me right back to when I was, you know, a teenager or whatever. But Yeah, I, I there are a couple maybe. I could think uh <laughs> you're gonna laugh at me. I don't know, Katy Perry put out some songs that like for whatever reason was just like peak like, you're in middle school dance. Yeah. I I don't know, I just like have this vivid memory of like this girl I liked, I wanted to dance with her and like, you know, teenage dream by Katy Perry comes on and I don't know what it was, but it just like fired me up and I was like, this is the moment I'm going to ask and like whatever it happened. So, you know, thanks, thanks Katy. (laughs) Like it's a memory. Yeah. There was a couple. 
Yeah, there's a couple that I can think of that I'm like, man, a lot. Some of that Mumford and Sons stuff, man, like they that that stuff got played a lot. And I'm like, dude, oh, yeah, those songs will probably stick in my head. You know, oh, yeah, they're, they're seared in my, in my mind for for a long time. OK, so we had we got the 70s, which you put at two, okay. you got the 90s, which you put at four. And then you put 2010s at five, which means you got one and three. Next up, we have the 1980s. Probably gonna, uh, I'm gonna probably put that at three. Interesting. So I don't know what's up, what I'm left with to make number one, but what do you want to be number one? I would probably have to go with the '60s. Interesting. Yeah. Last on the uh, last on the list here was the early 2000s, which oh, would be, okay. which, you'd, which puts me at number one. Which is fine. One. But I didn't I didn't have the '60s on this this scorecard um, this today. But totally the 60, cool. '60s I figured are, are your jam. Yeah, I like the you know I like. Again, I like all decades of, of music, but um, but yeah, early two thousands, man. Let's let's dig that. Let's let's pick that apart. Some of that was your. I mean, even some of the early Maroon Five stuff you were talking yeah. about was early two thousands. That first record, yeah, um, songs for Jane, dude. That, that came with, out in um, 04. I was in the fourth grade. Is dude, there and anyone that's the out there? That's because it's yeah. getting hard. Dude, Tell me that's that still not the best Maroon Five record. Crazy. Unfortunately, if they're watching this, I, I like a lot of their records, but nothing's ever going to top that first debut album, man. I know. Unfortunately, Adam Levine has aged quite, <laughs> developed quite interestingly, <laughs> yeah. but um, we'll save that for maybe another podcast. Um, There's also some like good. There was some good, good country music. I feel like in oh, yeah. the early 2000s. I mean, I still think of like you know. I mean, Tim McGraw was, I guess, a little back half of '90s too, but like into the 2000s, Rascal Flatts era. Yeah, like, and a lot of that early Brad Paisley stuff too. Yeah, um, that chicken picking stuff too. He's a great player, huh? He's great, man. I was a big Dirk Bentley fan. Gary Allen, man. I tell, yeah. I tell my team that, uh, gosh, man, so I, I just grew up on a lot of those, a lot of those Gary Allen records, um, and so that was all early 2000s as well. It was, yeah. Is there, is there, like, do you have like a dream collaboration, like somebody that you? Man, I get that. It, it changes all the time, but uh, I'd love to get into a, a room and maybe try to sing a couple songs with somebody like um, like Gary Allen. Mm -hmm. I'm always a big fan of voices, man. I'm always like, I might love somebody's music and stuff, but I'm always trying to think to myself whether or not our voices would mesh well together on a record. Is there anybody, is there, I mean. Like, I don't lead with like, oh, so-and-so is really hot right now. Like, right. if I collabed with them, it would be great for me. No, like, it's, like, I, I like to take their voice at face value and be like, yeah, they would, they would, we right. would sound. Like, I feel like Lana Del Rey mm -hmm. and my, like, I feel like her voice and my voice might be interesting together on the same, yeah. on the same song. Um is there anyone, is there anyone? Same like with the, Casey Musgraves. I love Musgraves, her voice. Musgraves, yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, I was, that was, I was going to ask, is there anybody like like right now and today like an up-and-comer or like a not that casey's new but like a a new-ish right. artist that like you know really fires you up just like vocally maybe it is casey yeah i mean yeah her um and i can't i'm not i can't really think of anybody right now i'll go of course laney wilson's killing it right now and, and i love her voice too she and i've done a couple radio things with her and she's a fantastic singer live too she sounds just like the the her yeah. records and so and I, i'm always a I love it when I see that, like, I'm, like when you see somebody really a well-trained vocalist, a well-trained singer. Right. Uh, I'd love to, I'd love to get to work with her. Some of the guys uh, that are out there that whose whose voices I think are are killer. Of course, I've toured I've toured with Parker McCollum for a couple years, and uh -huh. he's the same way. He, he's a great singer, and uh, and it sounds different. You know, there's nobody yeah. that he's trying to sound like and there's nobody that i can that I can think of that can sound like him so that's it's definitely got a unique vocal style which i think is rad speaking of well uh parker and well other other artists that have big texas following i was looking online i saw you do this like docuseries um mm -hmm. and you had it's pretty cool you had like you know, wade bowen was on there a couple of your other guys yeah. that like your, pat, pat green I think pat was green on was on there yeah like it was a cool little clip to watch can you talk to me a little bit about that documentary and sort of like what it means to you yeah so basically the as we were talking about earlier um in my hometown in acuna which is on the other side of the uh of the rio grande they used they used to do these concerts in like the late 90s and early 2000s where it was 
basically kind of like a spring break block party thing if you if you sounds like my jam no it was awesome <laughs> and a lot of the texas cats would go down there so pat green and robert earl keen the randy rogers band i mean you name it they all across canadian ragweed and and everybody would go to mexico for like a weekend and there was a, like a big block party and they would just kind of go crazy for a couple days and uh, it was a, it was a big thing back then but then that sort of died and uh they didn't do it for a long time and so that documentary was like a, sort of my attempt to kind of bring that back and we did it was really cool there's a thousand people that showed up to this we didn't shut down the street or anything but we did it there at the corona club which is the bar that i'm telling you about and they have a huge outdoor back patio and and uh and yeah it was really difficult to pull it all off because crossing equipment down across the border is really difficult and getting it back and then <laughs> say, the sound production i mean everything it. logistically yeah. was just really difficult i didn't even think of like no uh, sir it's not a bomb it's yeah a, it's a yeah snare exactly drum. yeah it, exactly and so but we did it and i think it was really cool for a lot of the a lot of the kids to have gotten to experience that but even but even like their parents like friends of my parents that were there that remembered 20 years ago when they used to do that and for them to get to sort of relive that it seemed like it was that's really cool. cool it's like a, it almost it's a cross-generational thing right the parents kind of relive the glory days and yeah. also get to show their kids a little bit of maybe a taste of what it was like for exactly. them growing up that's really cool man i love i love that documentary and for anyone watching that hasn't checked seen it you get, it's on your uh your yeah, it's on my, yeah it's on yeah. my website as well yeah okay, road cool. to acuna road to acuna i love it um I want to talk um, a little bit. I asked this question to pretty much, well, most of the artists on this podcast, but I'm very curious to get your answer. But how do you define success for you, for the industry? How do you define success? How do I define a success? Um, it, it's all, uh, to me personally, it's all an internal thing. It's all, it's only something that, uh, that you can define and, I always go back to this certain sense of fulfillment that I'm always trying to chase. And um, if you feel like you're achieving your purpose here, I think that's kind of the tr truest measure of of success. Because um, to me, it's not about the money or the accolades. Those things are great. Don't get me wrong. And it, and it definitely is sort of reassuring that you're like, okay, I'm doing a good job and people are uh, noticing and recognizing that. But... Mm -hmm. You know, if if you don't feel, if you don't feel that sense of fulfillment, like you're happy doing this, and you can you can have the gold records on the wall, and you can have all the money in the world, and and um, and and it might it it does it doesn't really mean anything. So to me, it just means it, it's it's, and they come in different ways, man. It's like little kids coming out to your shows or something, or asking you to to to, to sign a hat or something like that, like. That's crazy to me because, and it happens where it could be a seven or eight year old kid. I'm like, man, I remember doing that whenever I'd go to, that was how I looked at some of the guys I mentioned, like Gary Allen or whoever it was, you know, not yeah. to, not to compare myself to somebody like him, but to this kid or like that to me gives me the biggest sense of fulfillment in the world, the biggest yeah. joy in the world, you know, to see somebody like that or to see somebody singing my songs or to to read a message that somebody said, hey, you know, this song helped me get through this. I just want, wanted you to know, like, this is one of my favorite songs of all time. Thank you. Mm -hmm. That is what success is to me. And it comes in waves and it comes in different ways. But yeah, but, um, but yeah, man, I, I, I always try to really focus on taking those little moments and kind of patting myself on the back because that's, that's the whole reason I got into this mm -hmm. was to be able to to change the world one one little world at a time you know what i mean sure. so uh that's how i define success is 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 feeling um like feeling fulfilled and feeling like you're on the right track and that you're making a positive impact on people yeah that's i like that answer a lot Thanks. and i think that's it comes through with what you're doing comes through with your Man, I got to get to a live show of yours, dude. I Please do, seeing, man. You're welcome anytime. What's crazy is I'm like, I, I even watch it You got to, if we do Fast Car, you got yeah. to hype, you got to hype me up though. You got to be my background, I'll be, dude. I'll be your hype, man, dude. <laughs> Speaking of which, 
I saw you wear sunglasses quite a bit in some of your videos. Yeah. And one, there's a couple of videos, but one in particular, you go for a double sunglasses look. I'm curious, do you wear two <laughs> sunglasses just for like extra no. UV protection? Like what's no, the thought process there? I do have there? sensitive, I do, I will admit that I do have sensitive eyes, but that was just a funny video that we did where we were picking on my merch guy. Yeah. Um, but you know, again, I'm, I'm, I'm a big, you know, the more you get to know me, the more you'll understand my sense of humor, but. I just love funny content and putting stuff out there to to kind of let people into the that side of what not only I do, but my band and stuff and being on the road can be kind of grueling sometimes. So it is nice to lighten it up a little bit with some funny content. Uh, oh, I, I love it. Because TikTok's just... like a TikTok is heavily humor. Kind of, yeah, it's humor. Yeah. So it's like, I think that's what that one TikTok had that made it so viral is like, here you have me singing, trying to genuinely sing. You're like, oh, he actually's got a decent voice or whatever. And then my right. buddy's being a goofball in the background. And then you just merge like it's actually good and it's funny. And it's a perfect recipe for something to to go viral like that. And so we're always trying to make funny videos and just trying to lighten lighten the mood up a little bit. <laughs> That's all. Awesome. So yeah, right. I thought I thought it'd be funny <laughs> if we had two pairs of sunglasses on and nobody right. knew and you just take one off and you still have a pair on. Oh, dude, you that's know. awesome! I just didn't know. I just didn't know if you know you wearing two sunglasses. No, like if that you is had, by, if, I if, that, if, if I was, I, I, I hope that somebody would have like an, an honest sit down conversation with me if I if I genuinely walked around with two pairs of sunglasses on at the same time. Yeah, no, I was just curious if maybe you had some like insider info about you know the benefits of two shades no, versus I'm just very one. Squinty. You know, maybe you got you got that that medical <laughs> uh, I don't know insider info. Um, well, hey, we got just a few minutes left, so um, we're going to take a quick break, guys, and we're going to come right back and uh, talk a little bit about new music and uh, some new stuff. Thanks. What's up, guys? We're back. William Beckman in the studio. He is releasing new music. Put out two albums, but releasing new music on the road. Um, such a great hang, dude. I am really enjoying chatting with you, and I'm, I'm also very excited for this next uh, segment one because you have no idea what's coming but okay. two because um, it's one of my favorite segments with our friends over at Ariat um, they're a great western apparel company yeah. and um, they have tasked us with the opportunity to ask rapid fire questions okay. to our guests on the podcast <laughs> so the way this works is uh, we got 60 seconds on the clock I'm not these are just kind of simple yes or no questions they they get a little bit weirder as we go along and um we're going to wind up the clock to 60 seconds okay. and see how you do, okay? So it's just a yes or no? Pretty much. I cool. mean, there might be like, uh, there's simplistic questions okay. in themselves. So gotcha. um, we're going to see how you do. Don't be nervous. Okay. Um, whatever comes to mind, man. It's all good, baby. <laughs> so here we go. Rapid fire questions. Let's get it. What's the best type of muffin? Blueberry. Do you like the word dapper? Yes. If you were given an all expenses paid trip to Cleveland, would you take it? Of course. Ask for permission or beg for forgiveness. Ask for permission. If you would you eat a day old taquito from 7-Eleven? No. Would you rather go bald or grow 50% more hair everywhere else? <laughs> <laughs> Probably 50% more hair everywhere else. I feel, I feel like I'm going to regret that, but yeah. Is a handlebar mustache the best type of mustache? No. Um, using the Elmo voice, tell me how you like your coffee. I can't do that. <laughs> Last one. Uh, pickles, yes or no? Yes. I can agree with you there, and I still want to hear your Elmo voice at some point. Uh, I wish I could. I don't even know. I have to oh, practice. Man. Um, oh, and uh, you told me this earlier, but dream collaboration. Dream collaboration. We're, we're going to go with Casey Musgraves for the, for this one, just for the sake of picking one. There we go. Rapid fire questions. Um, you did really well. You Thank made you. it. You made it far. Thank you. A lot of people like choke up. Choke after up. The first take too one. long. Yeah, just gotta take too go long. With it. And you were just you were cruising, man. It was good. The only one I'm a little bit concerned about is the is the balding, or I feel like I would just have hair everywhere else except on my head, and which is probably not a, as good of a look as just being flat out bald yeah it, it would be well you just have to wear a lot of suits to yeah. cover it up um but be like a you, got, you got like a pretty sl like slick do going on thank you yeah you, do you use a lot of like hair gel not gel but there is like some pomade that i use that if i if i ever forget to pack yeah. it and it's like show day it's not good 
Yeah, you, you, you said recently. it with like it had a little like you had a little like palmade, like you gave it a little flair. Well, it gets you know? a little, it gets all over the place, and it's not the funnest to work with. But you know, you yeah. do it for the sake of the show and for the sake of the podcast. Yeah, yeah, you do it, you do it for the people. Look at <laughs> for that, the camera. right? That's awesome. So, I mean, I know you put out. Um, we we actually haven't a hundred percent talked about this. I want to talk about your most recent album, and then I want to talk yeah. a little bit about new music, but. What was because okay, so the most recent album, there's a couple songs on there. I'm I'm trying to make sure I get this right, yeah. but Tennessee Drinking, which I do now. Yes. And then the other one was called Damn This Heart of Mine, right? Yes. And the whole album's uh Here's to You, Here's to Me. Here's to You, Here's to Me, yes. Okay. So uh talk to me a little bit about the process of making that album. Um yeah. specifically I want to hear about Tennessee Drinking just because I love that song. Thank you, man. Um so yeah, this is like the first compared to the one before uh which was mostly written just by myself. I had a lot of collaborators on this, uh, on this particular project. And so Tennessee drinking is one that I wrote with Randy Montana and Jeremy Spillman, both of which are very accomplished, uh, songwriters. Um, so to get to work with them was, was a real treat. Uh, and those two guys definitely know how to write a, a good song. So I was lucky just to get to work with them. And damn, this heart of mine is a song that I wrote one afternoon with a, a friend of mine, who's a, a songwriter here in Nashville as well. His name's Nick Walsh. And, mm -hmm. and uh, we've written quite a few songs together on on this record. But it was really kind of nice to get to lean on other people and try to collaborate with other uh, songwriters because, like I mentioned, the first record was mo mostly just me and my songs that I'd written mm -hmm. by myself. So, yeah, this record... Uh, this last one was really cool to uh, have other people involved and and help me make the best creative decisions when it when it came to the actual writing of the songs. Do you do you like writing by yourself or writing with other people more? Um, they're they're two completely different experiences. I think it's nice to have a healthy balance between the two. I'm, that's something that I'm just now starting to try to get back into is writing. Uh, by myself some people think this is weird but I've done this for a long time but I've always been like a big Bob Dylan fan and uh, there's a couple other songwriters that I can think of that like there's old photographs of them using like an old mechanical typewriter like with the hammers and stuff and I've got like maybe four or five different typewriters mm -hmm. and I find it like when I write by myself I find it a really cool way to to write and just to kind of even if it's just lines or poetry or whatever like I I, I enjoy that part of it yeah, and so I used to do that a lot, and that's how I, I wrote a lot of songs. But in recent years, I've been touring and been so busy that it's it's hard to find the time to do that anymore. Uh, but I'd like to get back into it because it was I, I came up with you know I wrote songs like Bourbon Whiskey and In the Dark off of the first record like that, you know, and, mm -hmm. and those songs kind of came to me in fifteen twenty minutes. And it, it, you got to be there to capture lightning in a bottle like that when it when it hits. But uh, like you wrote the whole song in 15 minutes? Yeah, like I would sit down at a wow. typewriter and kind of like hammer out these ideas that would end up turning into these songs. And now the songwriting process, when when I'm co-writing, uh, especially here in town, is, you know, meeting with people and doing the meet up at 11 and write till three or four, which is great. I've written some great songs that way as well, but it's just a completely different Dude, it's experience. such a different process. It's so, if, like, I, if I brought my typewriter on Music Row, I'm pretty sure I'd get some weird looks. And I was going to say, you should typewriter. Phone call. You should typewriter too, not computer. I yeah. Was like, okay. I'd have to bring it in like a, I would have to bring it in like a wagon. Those things are too heavy to haul around. Dude, that's like classic. It was why, like, like it's a legitimate typewriter. Yeah. So they're mechanical. They're not electric typewriters because there's two kinds. Yeah. You know, the ones like in the 70s and 80s that you could plug in and stuff. Uh, these ones are the ones with the hammers. So like, yeah. and most of them are that I have are like vintage ones from like the forties and yeah. got one from the fifties. But again, it's just a cool way to get ideas out there. And one thing I personally like about it compared to writing like on a laptop is it doesn't allow you to backspace, you know, you can cross things out or just keep going. But, yeah. but I find myself sometimes writing and if, oh. if I write something and then I kind of change my mind rather than deleting it, I'd kind of just keep going. And oftentimes you find yourself going back and be like, oh, that that wasn't that bad after all. Dude, or or maybe, maybe, maybe it doesn't belong right there where you initially put it, but it it could belong later in the song or it could it could be its own idea separate from this song completely. But when you delete something on a on like a Word document or something, you'll never see it again and you don't really know if it was 
a right judgment call. You know what I mean? Some some things take a little bit of No, it's very interesting. It's kind of like you have to commit to the idea. And I mm-hmm. think like, you know, some ideas are, some, let's say, there are some bad ideas, but there are also some ideas that are bad and deleted that could be good yeah. ideas if they continue. Same so thing when you're just, writing things by hand. I think it's, I think anything creative, any any form of creative writing, if you're writing, if you're writing it longhand, it's better to scratch something out than to cross something out than to scribble it out. Like you always want to be able to be like, what was it that I, so, yeah. that I, uh, so you can revisit that I scratched out because I don't, I don't know if that was the right call. Interesting. Yeah. You'd probably still get some looks for a typewriter on music. Oh yeah. No, but, I don't, I don't bring but, it around. But I like the, I like the philosophy <laughs> behind it. It's good. Um, and it's funny cause I only really bought one and I would tell that same story to any, to a, and, and then I've gotten like, I've been gifted three or four other ones from other people, you know? So I've got like five of them now, Yeah, which is crazy. It's very cool though. Mm-hmm. I like that. I'm, I'm not in the typewriter game, but maybe I should. You really. should. It's fun. Tell you what, I'm it's more, good aesthetic too. I'm it's more just convinced like, now than I was five minutes ago. Yeah. I mean, and if you don't even have to use it. You can just put it on a, 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 a cool decor, you know? Yeah. So how do you balance with all this new stuff? I mean, you're writing and recording all this stuff, but then you're also like, you said like, you get a little grueling on the road, mm. play shows, go write music, you got to get me on damn Instagram and TikTok every day. It seems like, you know, how do you like, how do you balance it? Do you do anything outside of music? <laughs> like, uh, you, you know, know like, there, there are, I do where I come from, like my, my, I've got an older brother and my dad, you know, they like to fish and they like to hunt and do uh, outdoorsy things. And although it's been a minute since I've really had an opportunity to go do that, that's something that I do look forward to doing whenever I'm not working, mm-hmm. but also just taking time for myself, you know, resting. There's nothing wrong with, being a couch potato for you know, on a day off and watching something on Netflix. That's another thing. I don't really watch a lot of TV or anything. Um, mm-hmm. I watch some stuff on like flights and stuff, but I don't get to watch series or anything that, cause then I get upset because I get really, ad- like I get really into something and then yeah. I never have time to really finish it. Or, oh, or so it's just like, I'm like, ah, I saw the first three episodes and then I never followed back up with dude it. it's the worst man and there's everyone's talking about this the show suits which made like a big comeback this okay. past year and i got super into it and then like whatever last month of the year got like super hectic for me and i just like dropped out i haven't watched it since and it's like it's like killing me because yeah. it's like i left at the most like climactic part of yeah. the show so like maybe you're doing it, a yeah. good, well maybe you're doing a good job by not even diving into the tv show yeah itself. like i'm like i'm a big movie guy you know i can knock that you know a movie you knock out in two hours uh and then it's done with but yeah if it's like a series especially when it's yeah. when it's not when the series is still ongoing mm-hmm. like man i just don't have the time to like sit down and really what's your favorite movie uh probably the godfather the series of the godfather i'm like classic mm. with that but the first one's by far my favorite movie I can't crack you, man. You're just classic everything. You got the suits. You got the country. You I got, like old things. You got yeah. The, you, you got, you like but old you know, things. Godfather's got to be one of the best movies of all no, time, no, no, right? It is. I mean, it's it is. up I'm only, there. I'm, top only, five. I'm only poking fun at you. It's a top great. 10, right? It's, it's a, Oh, it's in it, rank these five things. It, it deserves, uh, you know, the one yeah. or two spots, certainly. Um, well, dude, it's been like, it's been great chat with you, man. I feel yeah. like we could, we could keep talking all day, but, um, Anything else that you want to let people know just before, that's it. before we wrap up? That's it. You know, I got new music that I'm working really hard on at the moment, writing a bunch of songs. And uh, we've announced quite a few shows, um, some Texas shows. We've got some out of state as well, too. So mm-hmm. be on the lookout for that. But, yeah, just follow follow me on Instagram and and uh, and all that stuff. And, and I'd love to see some, some new faces at some of these shows. I love it, dude. Well, I'm certainly a fan. I think everyone else, uh, you know that is maybe just watching this will become a fan or if they're not already uh william beckman go check him out guys um stuff's online it's on his uh, on his website and his youtube and, and and tiktok and all that jazz um and dude like so pumped for you so pumped for your sound it's very unique your style is very hip even Thank if you, man. you don't think it's hip i think it's hip <laughs> appreciate it um and uh thanks for jumping on this thank you man thank you for having me it's been a pleasure of course we'll see y'all next week for a new episode